when I was a child, my mother wouldn't let us play with Barbies because she said that's too, that's a terrible stereotype. For mm. one thing, you, your waist will snap in the middle <laughs> and you can never keep shoes on because you you, you've got these weird feet. Right. So we weren't allowed to have Barbie dolls. But I thank mum for being radical in that sense. Mm. She she was radical because she said that's not that's not a model for women. That's not what women look like. Welcome to another episode of This Catholic Life, conversations about life's ups and downs, big and small, how we deal with every situation imaginable, whatever life throws at us, but still manage to be sensible, practical, and joyful. Today's show is The Feminine Genius, a conversation about the unique and irreplaceable nature of women. Most of us agree that it's a good thing that women are in the world, but we have to ask the question, why? Why is that the case? And not why as in we're expecting the answer, well, it's not, but why What are the specific things about women that make them amazing, irreplaceable, and make the whole world much better? I'm your host, Peter Holmes, and I'm joined today by Sylvana Scarf, who works as a research assistant to Bishop Umbers, a co-host of this show. Uh, That's his main claim to fame. But other than that, he runs around the diocese doing things as an auxiliary bishop of Sydney. And also, you're the bishop delegate for life. Is that correct? The bishop is. Oh, right. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's probably a good distinction to make there. I was going to say, how did you get to be a bishop delegate? Well, you know, not, we haven't yet got to that point. That was a bit provocative. Uh, Anna Crone is also joining us, an educator and educational writer who's worked for the John Paul II Institute, the Australian Catholic University, and now is consulting for the University of Notre Dame in her spare time when she's not running around talking about the feminine genius, women, and many other interesting topics as part of anime education and other ventures. Welcome, Anna. Thanks, Pete. I should, uh, full disclosure here, I worked for Anna a long time ago. Gosh. I don't think I want to list the years of that. Let's just say it was a long time ago when I was in Melbourne. We have enjoyed a working relationship since then because what tends to happen is that I get invited to speak on masculinity and Anna gets invited to speak on femininity, which is kind of annoying because when the other each of us aren't around, I'm sure Anna has a lot of fun talking to men about being men. And <laughs> oh, it's kind of an illustration of complementarity, yes, really. Yes, it is. It's good fun. What? Sometimes I wonder, though, maybe I'll open up with this. This isn't on the list of things we were supposed to talk about, but is it a bit weird to just talk about women? Like I find that sometimes when I'm talking about just men, I think, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff I need to say about men and women and how they relate to each other before we can actually make sense of it. It sounds a bit weird, but I think in some ways, Peter, what happens is that there is a real question hanging over identity these days. And what does it mean to be a man and a woman? I think Mm. it's a pretty universal question. And it's a bit like starting with the know thyself question. Right. Um, that you, you, The more you understand yourself as a woman or as a man, I think the more you understand about the other sex. Mm. Uh, and I, I found that I've had a great time com- having a conversation about this with men who are priests particularly. It's very fascinating. They, they open up about how they appreciate understanding women and then we have a, a great right. conversation. So I think... Because so much of this is based on getting in touch with the core experience of who we are. Right. I think that's why we start there, but we don't finish there. Hmm. There is a lot of stuff out there. I mean, if, don't Google this, people who are listening. But if you happened to make the mistake of Googling, you know, gender identity, there's a whole lot of stuff that you'll come across that you didn't, you don't necessarily wish you read. I don't think we can understand either masculinity or femininity without the other. Like, mm-hmm. I think it's integral that when we look at what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, we, to some degree, have to understand what the the other is. Right. Because God created us as male and female. Right. And he created us specifically in that way. So to bring glory to him in many ways. So mm. we can't really, I think, completely understand our own experience without um, the experience of the other. So you've referred to the theological principle there that in Genesis God says he made his own man in his own image, which was male and female, and that image of God mm-hmm. is in that way. But even take a step back just for rational argument, not opposed to religious argument, but as a, a rational argument, what happens if all the men, so there's only men on the world, quite apart from all the usual jokes that happen at this stage, or there's only women in the world. You're not talking about women as if women being a woman is a thing because that's just everyone Mm -hmm. it's the difference which makes you want to talk about being a woman or a man absolutely okay um well this feminine genius word this phrase that i've brought up several times where does this come from anna 
It's, it's a great question, Peter, and it's not an easy question to answer. It, it's been used, it's capturing an idea about genius of place, something inherent to a place that was sort of being talked about in the 19th century. But in a way it was picked up in, from a number of different thinkers, especially Edith Stein, who was the great uh, philosopher, convert from Judaism, great um, teacher about women, and then she became a Carmelite contemplative mm. and then a martyr. She, in some ways, is like the mother of feminine genius. Right. Um, she thought a lot about what, how to, to the question of the education of women, and she, in in thinking about that, she wanted to think about identity. But she grounded her thought both in her philosophy. She began to study Saint Thomas and the Scriptures. So I'd say she's one of the starting points for feminine genius. But there are some others as well. All that was really interesting, but what if I'm not a scholar? And I just said, well, hang on, you've just told me a lot of people who said stuff about feminine yep. genius. What, what are we talking oh, about? Oh, you know, I, th- I think it's a universal thing in the language of, of many cultures, isn't it? Right. We say, that place needs a woman's touch. Okay. Or that needs a woman's eye. Right. You know, if you go into a submarine, they say, that needs a woman's <laughs> eye. Um, and and they kept, they're trying to reach out to something they know is distinctive about... I'm intrigued. So what is it about submarines that need... Oh, I don't know. I'm just thinking about, <laughs> for years they've been very masculine environments. Oh, I see. Yeah, okay, and, so they're masculine dominated. And, and, they, and, you know, in the literature, in literature you'll see an attempt to capture this idea. It was really someone like uh, St. Edith who really systematically thought about it. So that's why she's a useful... Right. Um, sort of benchmark, but not the only one, and we'll talk more about other people that mm. have thought about this. She wrote, she wrote a lot about what does it mean to be a woman because there were a lot of – it wasn't something that was popular to talk about at that stage. No. Really. Just she was also – she began as a feminist right? in in the, the time with suffragettes and, and she – uh, suffragettes uh, people for our who, younger listeners. <laughs> you know, women didn't always have the vote. Actually, men didn't have the vote yes. either. But um, women didn't have the vote, and so she was very um, – concerned about that and, and began to go along the line of a sort of secular feminism. Right. And then she realised that there was something more going on that mm. needed to be talked about. I believe one of the first uh, people that coined the term was John Paul II. Mm. Um, I think it was in um, his 1988 apostolic letter, um, Mulieris Dignitatum, on mm-hmm. the vocation dignity of women. And he, so he really explored um, a really beautiful understanding of what it means to be a woman and the unique part that we play in the world but also in the Mm. church specifically it's it's Um, in the name really is it the genius it's not just the bit that women do or the woman's touch it's actually a genius something amazing and exciting and something inherent in that something you know natural to her Mm. Mm. and it's not simply instinct it's important to as Silvana said John Paul really nuanced even Edith Stein's idea right by saying it's not just an instinct it's more like a capacity that needs to be developed and recognised. Mm. And because we live in a fallen world, sometimes the effects of sin damage the very genius that we have. There's lots of debate in various circles about something to do with traditional, what people call traditional roles, right? And usually I come across this phrase when either some uh, feminist is having a go at me for being too traditional in my view of femininity or something, usually they're wrong about that, or it's a man trying to tell me off because I'm not traditional enough and that somehow traditional idea of women is, is some sort of Christian ideal. What do you think about the idea of traditional womanhood? We'll go to the, the younger Savannah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Oh, I think it's, it's, it's a real caricature, really. So it's, it's all about... That's an excellent word, caricature. Um, it, it's all about uh, being in the kitchen, right. um, cooking meals for everybody, basically... Dressing a certain way, okay. Uh, looking a certain way, behaving a certain way, and right. I'm not saying certain uh, things are uh, shouldn't be allowed or, or anything. What I'm saying is that there's a specific kind of mold in what we what we consider a traditional woman, yeah. um, and I think that it's in many ways it's a caricature of right. the actual what it actually means to be a woman and God's intention in making us women. Mm. And how that is, should be lived out in our day to day, in in our choices, and because it gets a little hard. Like, and there is something in the modern gender debate, uh, Anna. You'd probably come across this a lot too. In the modern gender debate, they, there's a lot of assertion that all these ideas, like the woman should be in the home, the 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 man's got to be the one working. All these ideas come from a kind of a social imposition of norms. And th- there's a fair amount of truth to that. That we we have expectations. When I grew up, I was often asked if I was gay because I didn't drink. 
um, I was from a particular Christian group that didn't drink because I didn't drink beer. And in the country, that's just, you know, what are you, gay? Um, or if you play tennis. Yeah, apparently well, I, that was the other one <laughs> in country. I didn't Bizarre. play tennis. <laughs> it was more than my <laughs> life was worth. Um, I didn't leer at the girls in the same way as my guy, my friends in the change mm. rooms would do. Um, I didn't, you know, do these things. And I, I told them off when they um, said silly things about women. And I got, you know, what are you? some sort of weirdo, you're not a real man kind of thing. Mm. And um, even stupid things. Like I remember my dad saying to me, real men don't eat quiche. <laughs> that was like a, quiche. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was a real little thing, wasn't it, yeah. back in those days? I think one of the great things about John Paul II's idea of the feminine genius, um, which Sylvanas mentioned, is that in some ways it's very radical. Right. It actually challenges um, tradition. Do you mean radical in the sense that it goes back to the goes root? goes back to the source right. and doesn't – and questions some of the ways in which we – I mean, there's a, I think in tradition there's two sides to tradition. One is carrying on wisdom right. and one is carrying on convention. Okay, let's distinguish between them. So one of them is when there's something that's actually a really good idea mm. that you tell your kids because you want them to have a really yep. good idea. Mm -hmm. But the other one is you have to do it this way because I had to do it this yep. way. And it's distinguishing between the two that right. I think is the, the art form there because quite often traditions carry on a wisdom yep. about being a man or being a woman. They have customs, they have initiation things, they have a way of communicating which recognises mm -hmm. the truth about men and women but sometimes that os uh, that solidifies into a into a, a, an unthinking kind of convention which actually right. becomes quite oppressive yeah and i think in that fact there's some pretty bad ideas from my very up very that I you shouldn't know, pass on foot binding bad idea um <laughs> you know women should have little feet yep. they're delicate and beautiful but it's a brutal thing yes. and in fact it's a violent thing to do to women and we rightly christians rightly oppose foot binding yes and that's an example of a tradition that's kind of gone down the wrong path and we shouldn't be too distressed by that because we know we're in a fallen world. So whole cultures, as John Paul would say, can fall into structural sin. Right. That is not getting it getting yep. and, and actually turning it into a violence. In, in fact, almost any time, and this is part of the point of the, the whole feminine genius and the, the focused on individual contributions, is that the whole point of this is whenever a structure tries to tell us we all have to conform in order to be a certain identity, then we're going to have people, or a lot of people who don't fit. And then the ones who do fit are actually compromise, compromising their their individual unique genius by repressing it to fit into a mould. So yeah, that's an interesting... Dietrich von Hildebrand is someone I want to come back to yep. in this because he's got some brilliant approaches to Yay. masculinity and femininity. Yeah. Um, when, <laughs> when people talk about the, the traditional roles, I always get a little bit narky at them because usually what they mean is what they've seen on a Pride and Prejudice movie or, mm -hmm. you know, this kind of idea of um, Elizabethan Puritanism when, in fact, uh, you know, they, someone actually said to me, traditional biblical roles, and I said, get your Bible out and show me where this rubbish is. You show me where any of this actually appears. And, and then I'll tell you what, what to look for in, say, Proverbs 31, where it talks about the woman being a real estate manager, a yes. property developer, you know, a businessman. Yeah. There's all these things that she is. With, and while her husband Mary Magdalene herself, yes. who probably ran a business <laughs> because it said she supplied to, you know, the Lord out of her own means, which may have meant she ran a pub. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but certainly to have means is something in itself. But the 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 point I'm making is that the the so called tradition is whatever really the last generation passed to this generation. Um, now hopefully it's come from other places and we need to examine it. We need to examine it. is this dignified? Is this actually helpful? Uh, does it respect our dignity? On the other hand, we need to be careful of to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. And there's been a little bit of that lately. Maybe I'll throw to you guys, but the impression I get from the outside is there's lots of people trying to tell women, yeah, you shouldn't take anything from the past at all. You should just pretend there's no difference between men and women kind of thing. Yeah. The, I think that's getting quite amusing because many of the people who are rejecting tradition are actually starting their own tradition. <laughs> um, and they have a very, very... So an example? Well, there's sort of sometimes a form of political correctness which right. says you must not say this mm. because this is um, discriminatory against women. Okay. And so that works the other way. So, for instance, one thing I find difficult is a culture which says you're only a real woman if you go out to work. Right, okay. Now, because, I object yeah, that's to, a rejection of the staying at home. And I, reject, yeah. I don't want to – I, I think women shouldn't say they're stay-at-home mums. I think they should say they labour in the home. Right. In the same way that carers do. Right. That has been radically undervalued in most economies especially capitalist economies. Yep. And 
I think we should be radical enough to say, no, the home actually is the centre of our lives. Yes. And, and without the, it, where it actually costs us lots and lots absolutely. and lots of money. Mind you, that doesn't necessarily mean the woman's the one to do it. No, not at all. And it doesn't mean that she can't work in other ways that contribute to the, the wider society. In yeah. fact, I think Edith Stein and John Paul say that Psalm, you know, Psalm 21 actually says these women are absolutely integral right. to the to the the flourishing of society. Yes. And we've you know you know someone like Betty Friedan who called the home uh, concentration camp for women <laughs> um, said that because she could see the kind of consumerist emptiness that sometimes locked women into the next appliance they had to buy. She mm. said that's a bit of a construction. I think we can sort of agree with her about that. Who, who was it who said that um, marriage is a, 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 just a formalised form of prostitution? Right, yeah, that was um, one of the Australian feminists, That, that you think. sort of trade over yourself um, yeah. the sexual favours in order to get security and other things. And you think, well, gosh, have, have we stopped talking about love at all like yes. in terms of an, a well, possibility of two people actually sharing goals and, and working together towards something that's amazing? Yeah. So I, I do think that the, you know it's about being evaluating tradition always. We always have to look at tradition and see that key, that key word that you used, Peter, was the dignity of mm. the person, the truth about the person, what is owed to the person. Right. That is a continual exploration. We constantly go back to it. And we know the scriptures and... Christ himself gave it, gave us wonderful examples of what dignity looks like. So he talks to the woman at the well, and, and by all social standards, she's now well, he shouldn't be talking to a woman. He shouldn't be talking to an outcast. He shouldn't be talking to a Samaritan, a sinful woman. She's in, on, in, on her sixth um, attempt at marriage. So there's a kind of a, a you know an ongoing list of why he shouldn't talk, and he simply talks. Mm-hmm. And then when the topic comes up, of course, he doesn't back away from it, but. He doesn't lead from that, and that's not why he's talking he to her. He doesn't reduce her to no. her f- to any of those categories. No, no, that's it, exactly right. Even when one of them is something that he would say, maybe not do that anymore. Mm. Now, there's a word that comes up in the feminine genius, complementarity. Now, by there's an E in there, not an I, complementarity. Um, it's not just me saying to my wife, you look beautiful today, although that's a nice thing. Complement each other means that there's some kind of mutual uh, completion, if you like, or building up of the other. I'll throw it to you, Silvana. What do you think complementarity means? Complementarity, I believe, means a real kind of integrated coming together of qualities or capabilities or characteristics um, that fr- from two people, mm-hmm. I guess, that really kind of bring together and uh, highlight one's strengths. In other words, when the one person isn't lost in that, yeah. they become more themselves in their Basically, interaction with the yeah. other. Now, yeah. I could say that about Mike and I. Mike's my producer. Mike and I have different skills. We know what those skills are. We work well together. We complement each other. We're talking about men and women in a particular mm-hmm. way here. Now, uh, I'm not married to Mike. Um, as nice as he is, that's not my goal. <laughs> I already have a wife. But what? How, perhaps I'll throw it to Anna here. What's the difference between a complementary working relationship or a friendship and something which is specific and unique to the complementarity of man and woman. Um, Pope John Paul II tries to pick up and explain what that means. He says there's a sacramental quality, that's the way he uses it, he says there's it built into our embodied difference as men and women that is quite unique. It's not like differences between individuals, mm. which also works on complementarity. So a good workplace works on complementarity yeah, at a well, certain you, level. Everyone's got their own part so to play here. Yeah. That's, all, that's all very good. But he says that there's more uh, sort of meaning, if you like, God, God or originated meaning built into being a man and a woman that reveals something about who God is, mm. about the way God works with difference. So we can look at men and love. women yes. and go, oh, we know something more about God. Exactly. And particularly in certain, of course, marriage. Right. And in within marriage too, the uniqueness of the way in which marriage is the place where children are born and nurtured and educated. So co-creators. Co-creators. Let, let's nail it down. I mean, this is all very well to say we see something of God in a man and woman together. Mm-hmm. What? Love. Yes, but I mean, I can love Mike. Not in the same way. Not in the but same I way. <laughs> but not in the sacramental way, you see. This is the thing that John Paul II is trying to say. It's right. deeper. It's going back to this original way in which the Blessed Trinity loves its lo- loves within the Blessed Trinity. So there's a self-giving, yes. there's a service, there's a receptivity between a man and a woman that's even prior to the intellectual, right? prior to the moral issue. Sometimes people reduce the church's teaching on sexuality, oh, it's just a moral issue. Mm. It, it's, an, it's a deep 
deeper reality. It goes to the meaning of who we are. The meaning of who we are, yeah. exactly. And, I, I, and we call that, you know, I suppose we call it in, in, in philosophy something like the ontological difference, right. which means this is about the core mystery of reality. Yeah. That's true. And if we try to avoid it, as some sometimes, hist- you know, ideologies have tried to do. So mm-hmm. let's take the kibbutz in Israel. There was an attempt to do away with the family. It's okay. Everybody can bring up children neutrally right? in, in, in a communal setting. It was so a, instead of having a mum and a dad and a family. Yeah, you just have everyone brings up the kids. Everyone goes to a creche. There's no, there's no yeah. sort of special thing about parenthood. Okay. There's nothing special about marriage particularly unless you like it. It's, you know, it's an optional extra. <laughs> um, and, and what happened? It was just a psychological disaster. Right. And a sociological disaster because children want parents need parents. Yes. We know that. And we know even if, if they have to have a parent figure as in adoption, which is very important. Mm-hmm. Isn't it interesting that even when people are adopted, there's still a deep psychological need to find birth Absolutely. parents. Mm-hmm. No matter how broken or hurt or rejected they felt by that parent, they still have to find out because there's something deep in us about roots, about exactly. where we come from and and how we fit in the world. We might decide we want we we won't accept the example we've been handed by our parents, and hopefully all of us have made some sort of critical judgment about yes. that and moved on. But we we take that as a starting point, and it's a really solid sort of reference point in the world. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's such a primal thing yeah. about who we are, and and we can't you know you can't sort of change that. It's there, mm. but there's lots of variations on that, and sorry, that don't mean you set. Yeah, sorry. I'll pick you up on that. That you you can't change where you started. No. But, but you that, doesn't, that doesn't determine your future. And I think Pope John Paul II would say right at the heart of this difference between men and women yep. is he uses it in a very deep sense, not in a, in a functional or role-based sense. He said when men are fulfilled, they fulfill their fatherhood and when women are fulfilled, they fulfill their motherhood. It doesn't mean biological motherhood or procreational motherhood. Right. He means it in a, in a deeper, almost spiritual sense. Mm. And well, he does talk about spiritual motherhood, doesn't he? I mean, why do we call Mother Teresa Mother Teresa? Because she has displayed her maternal qualities mm. to, a, to a great degree. In um, fact, in some ways, she's displayed them more than some physical absolutely. mothers in that she has, if you like, adopted and in her spiritual uh, motherhood has been fruitful in and many I, ways. And I think many feminists need to hear that message of the church. And the church was an exemplar right. in of the life of, you know, within the Catholic tradition. There's been so many women who have lived out their feminine genius for the sake of the church or the, for the sake of others. And they are our saints. Yep. St. Teresa's visiting Sydney at the moment. She she lived out this extraordinary vocation. Mm. Um, she wasn't bec- much of a feminist, though. Which, I mean, I'm just in terms of the modern definition she, of feminism. She wasn't an you know she didn't have an ideology of feminism, <laughs> but in fact, she contributed as a doctor of the church. Let's yes, think about it. Yes, that's feminine genius. Absolutely. At a, at a church level, question that someone like Simone de Beauvoir was worried mm. about, and that was the lack of freedom. So she she associated yes. being a woman as being fated by your biology. So for her, motherhood was something that women rarely chose. So for her, freedom was one of the questions that made her think motherhood was oppressive because it was just expected that every woman would fulfil herself. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. So for her, the female body, even the, the structure of the female body, she found a limitation on the sort of freedom that she could see the men in the French resistance and the men mm. in the I- I- existent, you know, you know so her lover was a terrible betrayer of her, by the way, which I think really did set her against that whole mm-hmm. notion of the women's body. Mm. But she tried to understand why women um, were oppressed. And she said their bodies are part of what oppresses them. Which is quite, I mean, it's manifesting itself now in in a lot of the the reactions to gender. There's people who are actually now aggressively trying to change the bodies exactly. as a kind of a reaction to it. Now, it's really an extension. Can of I that come back problem? to something you said there? There's two things in that, I mean, there's lots of things, but there's two things I picked up in what you just said. Firstly, her experience with men ended up shaping her understanding of men mm-hmm. and women because she had a bad experience and that shaped it. But the first one you mentioned was about the circumstances which were forced upon women. So once they became the mother, there was a social expectation. That means you no longer go in the French resistance. You no longer do this. You no longer work. You are now stuck at home and these are the tasks allocated to you. Oh, we, the father? Oh, no, he's off doing the, with the pub with his mates. He's doing it. Now, that is actually a reality which had to be addressed and should still be addressed. And part of the problem, this is what I say to the men when all the women aren't listening, is that the problem isn't that the women are going to work. The problem is that men long ago decided that work was the place they found their identity, not the home. 
the problem is, I don't actually don't think it has anything to do with masculinity or femininity with your work. I think it, what you're defined by is your the primary commitment you both have to the family life, and and that work sort of moves around that, and whatever works for the family works. There's still that emphasis. Like I know guys who stay home with the kids, and there's like a kind of a weird sort of stigma with that still. Even in this modern age. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's part of the reason why I don't use the phrase stay-at-home mother because right. I think, why is it staying at home? In fact... <laughs> I don't know if anyone's ever I mean, done this, but mum, my wife doesn't stay at home at all. I know. <laughs> There's all sorts of stuff about? going on. And, and I often find you know, wonderful women who are working at home and they're volunteers and they're running things in the parish and, and they say, I don't work. And I said, you're kidding. Yeah, you've got all this free time. You what, what is wrong though? <laughs> and what is an injustice, which I think... Some of the feminists at least identify. They often identify the problems but don't have solutions for right. these problems. So I think we, I think John Paul II is very respectful of some of the things that feminists raise, but he says they're going in the wrong direction. Hmm. And in um, Evangelium Vitae, he says, I, I want there to be a new feminism. And what he means by that is I want there to be something that respects the dignity and the justice to women, which does not, as he says, imitate male models of domination. Right. In and other I, words, I, they're not just trying to men. make the same don't mistakes men. men you know, men don't become made. a mad woman just because there's mad men in the in the in the marketplace. <laughs> and I think women are really struggling with that today. Right? How do we keep the gains, the educational gains, the work opportunities? All those things are positive, and John mm. Paul II says so. How do we do that without betraying our feminine genius? How do we live up to our feminine genius in this world? And can I come back to complementarity? Where do men fit in this picture? Because it seems as if in a lot of the images of womanhood that, that I've heard espoused, it, the role of men is to not be there, right? Because I've yes. turned up to women's conferences, and I was actually running one of them, turned up to women's conferences and to women, feminine, uh, sorry, feminist biblical conferences and been kicked out because I have a beard and it's hard to pass as a woman. So, well, these but, days you could make a bit of a claim. <laughs> no, I don't think I could. You could just say it today, I feel like. No. But my question is, where do, surely in an ideal world, if we're aiming for this, if in an ideal world, femininity and masculinity are perfectly understood and balanced, where do men fit? Like, is there a place for men over, you know, in relation to women? Absolutely. Good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, suddenly I'm relevant again. Okay, go on. I think... In many ways, women, I mean, this might be a very controversial thing to say, but women cannot be women without men. Oh, there you go. So and let's... men can't be men without women. Okay. So I think that it's so, it's integral, it's vital for to be able to understand in a healthy way God's intention and plan in making the human person male and the human person female. Right. That... W- if, if we can understand both together and we, and we un- need to understand that in, in glorifying God in the best way that we can, mm-hmm. we both need to be able to uphold one another in okay. our masculinity and in our femininity. Mm. Something you said earlier is that the very fact that we're made as man and female says something, not we said it was something about God, but it also says something about what the purpose of this whole thing is. And John Paul II talks about the nuptial meaning of the body, meaning this shows you, the fact that I'm a guy and, and there are girls out there, shows me I'm actually built to have this relationship with another other human beings, but in particular one very um, special relationship there with another human being that goes to levels which isn't, isn't just randomly human. It actually goes to you're built for this communion mm-hmm. uh, of persons, which is the image of God. The actual we're not just imaging God in intellect and will, but in the actual interrelationship with people, which kind of means you've got to have someone to talk to. You've mm. got to have someone else to have that gift gift of self given to and received. Precisely because of the different genius that men and women have, that complementarity in the formation of the person, which is an area I'm interested in, is very important and. Um, Many psychological studies now show that women who have a very positive relationship with their fathers or some other father figure actually do extremely well in areas that are sometimes considered to be male dominated. Right. Sort of. And two examples I can think of straight away, one with the father and one with the husband, are two holy women of Australia. They're not yet saints. One is Mary Glary. Yes. It was her father who said, I know you're interested in Shakespeare and I know you like humanities. Uh, Dr. Mary Glary is a servant of God now. Mm. But he said, have you ever thought about serving God by being a doctor? (laughs) So it was her father's confidence in her her intellectual ability 
that actually encouraged her to think about God's will in that mm. way. And she was the one of the first, um, in fact, she was the first religious sister first to be a doctor. First religious sister in modern times um, to be a doctor. She had to yeah. get special permission from the Pope. And then from then on, it became possible for, for women who were religious women to be doctors. So. She was also one of Australia's work in the pioneering for women being doctors in Australia. Extraordinary woman. Yeah. And um, the second person is Caroline Chisholm, yep. Mrs. Mrs. Chisholm, who wanted to – it really founded social work in Australia. Right. She was a Catholic woman, very holy woman. I know a lot of people want her to be on the way <laughs> to sainthood as well. But she um, married a man who was a Catholic, um, Archie, her husband, Archibald. And he uh, he was an integral part of her mission. And she when she, he proposed to her, he was a, a Highlander, a Scottish Highlander, and he said, <laughs> I want to marry this remarkable woman. She goes, well, I've got a mission. I want you to go away for 12 months – and think about whether you're going to be part of my mission. <laughs> <laughs> and he came back in twelve months. And said, "Yep, I'm in for it." I'm in. <laughs> a- and he was. And he's a bit of the. Sh- he's the the untold hero in. So behind every great woman is often a man. Right. And and in his case, in her case, it was her husband Archie. So I think if her cause is introduced, I think Archie should be considered a bit like Zelie and Louis. Right. You know, I think he's he's a he's a fabulous person who supported her crazy her crazy adventures up and down Australian coast, settling mm. convicts, finding work for women, um, taking women out of prostitution. What an extraordinary person she was. And she was a, mm. a woman who I think was a, a very, uh, is a very likely candidate for another cause. So feminine genius in both those cases. Yeah. I mean, I mean it, really, if we're going to imi- uh, mirror the image of God, then in any relationship we have, we want the other person to flourish. Yes. We want them to be who God created them to be. And if someone's brilliant, then there's no jealousy in that. I say they're brilliant. I want that to flourish. I'll do what it takes to help that person to flourish, especially so of the most intimate partner in my life, but also of everyone. There's also an element of the complementarity that comes in, I think, that we haven't explored in the church in the recent times, but I think it's starting to develop organically. And that is the kind of mentorship of men to w- women and women to men. Many great women saints have had great spiritual directors who are male. Right. Um, so that's been in the history. But in the medieval period, many great men had holy women who were yeah. their mentors. So we think of someone like St. Catherine of Siena yep. who, you know, marched the Pope back to Rome. Um, <laughs> it wasn't so much a mentor as a mum. A mum. <laughs> Get said, back home. Yes, come home and clean your bedroom. <laughs> but I think that – And all um, the men at the time were too gutless to talk <laughs> to the Pope that way. <laughs> but I think that there's a, a very important role for priests with women, you know, very yep. good sisterly relationships or, you know, maternal relationships. And that addresses like. some of the issues that came up in the Royal Commission where the, bit, the men really didn't understand women at all. Yeah. And then what they really needed was a mentor who could say, look, listen up. Yeah. Pay attention, and and one of I suppose one of the things that uh, Edith Stein talks about when she tries to she doesn't call it the feminine genius, but she calls it the qualities of women. She has three areas that she particularly focuses on, and she ta- she goes back to Genesis, like John Paul too, um, and I suppose John Paul may have been inspired by her actually, because um, she goes to precisely those sections, mm-hmm. and he says you know the, she calls it the spouse, the companion, and the mother right. as the three areas in which women the shape of feminine genius takes place, mm. and it's a sacramental reality rather than a role-based reality. Mm. So she writes, an engineer who's a woman will bring those that quality to her being an engineer. That means she'll notice people. She'll be sensitive to people. She'll be alert to relationships. Yep. And women do that, and you see them come into a room and do that. They, they watch who's mm. alone, who's not talking to someone. Is Edith Stein did a really good job of listing the kinds of observational things we can say about men and women. I'm going to sort of push it a little further and say I think John Paul II went a step further than yeah. that and he said he th- speculated that the reason might be, or oh, I think he's got onto something here, is that whether or not a woman is a mother, she instinctively knows from, a, you know, from the time she's um, at puberty that life begins inside. Even before that, yeah. if you see little girls with dolls right. or, you know, um, if you try, if you see what do they do, they embrace the doll. Yep. And Edith Stein does talk about taking the scriptures again that a woman is works with her hands. Mm. She does works with her hands in a different way to a man, and she draws like, people to her. My kids, some um, I have various children of 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 both uh, sexes, and my boys wanted to play with dolls, and I went, okay, that's cool. Yep. Except they always played, you know, doctors. Um, 
<laughs> spinning around disasters. The doll's house had an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> the pram was racing cars. It was um, – <clears throat> now, they're not all like that, but the, um, the, the difference of approach was interesting. He also says of men, by the way, they have to learn their fatherhood through the mother. So they, they, they don't have direct access to that intimate moment, that, that nine-month moment of, of relationship within the woman. So it's an interesting – it's more about perspective, I guess, on different It lives. is. And, and also mm. I think that women – there's a – I think we should say it's a sort of tendency as well. Right. Because there are men who are very sensitive and yes. there, there are men who – are aware of a relationship. So it, it, we, we sort of have to be careful that they kind of overlap. One one of the writers about this, uh, Cardinal Angelo Scola, calls it an asymmetrical complementarity. Yeah. In other words, it's, it's not pepper and salt it's shakers. It's not a line down the middle it's that not says Ken and Barbie. It's, it's not Ken and Barbie. I yeah. say it's not Ken and Barbie because Ken and Barbie are two bits of plastic <laughs> and they have nothing going on inside, sorry right. to tell you. But they are, they are the example of a stereotyped male and female. And yep. when I was a child, my mother wouldn't let us play with Barbies because she said that's too... That's a terrible stereotype. For mm. one thing, you, your waist will snap in the middle, <laughs> and you can never keep shoes on because you sh- you've got these weird feet. Right. So we weren't allowed to have Barbie dolls. But I thank Mum for being radical in that sense. Mm. She she was radical because she said that's not that's not a model for women. That's not. Yeah. Women I mean, the look whole like. looking for a certain thing in women as a as a sort of a stereotype of womanhood is a, is a dangerous thing. What's interesting to me recently is that. Christians have been more or less pushed to the outer on this discussion, so much so that um, you can't really talk about femininity without someone getting a bit agitated about the fact that you're defining someone by their gender. And a lot of recent documents coming out of Australia say there's, I think the Australian Human Rights Commission said there's 26 genders that they listed. 52, no. Is it 52? Right, okay, there you go. There is one of the genders that they list, which seems to mean that you change according to the circumstances as you go through. Now, this idea of changeability, self-definition, if you like, has been very much behind the trans um, idea. And it's it's a function of their argument that you can change gender, so to speak. But I always – it's interesting that when someone claims to have changed gender – they're always trying to define themselves by some by the most stereotypical idea of the the opposite gender. So they want to, um, you know, look more like a woman, or and quite serious operations, quite serious changes of lifestyle, etc., um, hormones, etc., are involved in this. They say I'm not defined by my physicality, and yet they have to change the physicality. Um, what's interesting to me is that the radical um, feminists are the ones pushing back on this very, very angrily, mostly because they're saying we fought for a long time to have safe spaces for women and now you're telling me that all a bloke has to do is say I'm a woman and now I can walk into that safe space. It's almost this weird like conundrum in that genders become like something that we should not even kind of consider anymore. So it's like everyone needs to be equal and so there's like kind of no gender. And then Except that it may, it's such a big deal for everyone. Exactly. But then it's become this like obsession in that it actually does matter because right. so much of what people say want to change about themselves comes down to the physical characteristics, mm. for example, of what it means of, of, of men and women. Now, so, sorry, just briefly, we should say if someone has a confusion or a hurt in the area of their sexuality, it is since it's such a central part of us, that's got to hurt like hell. It does. Mm. And it, we, yeah. we'd never dismiss something like that as if it were trivial because this is absolutely important and essential. But when I'm talking to trans friends who are, you know, trying to tell me off for being Catholic usually when they find out I'm Catholic, but when I'm talking to them, I've been friends with them for some time, they say, why do you think this? I say, look, just assume I'm wrong about everything. Let's just assume I'm wrong and that you want to become a woman. What's a woman? Yeah, it's very, it's, it becomes a real conundrum. What as, is it? As Silvana says. Yeah, and what do, do they respond to that? Well, this is it. Usually they get angry and have a go back and say, you say this. No, no, let's assume I'm wrong. What's a woman? I'm trying to understand what you want to assert you are because you've said it's not your body. You've said it's not stereotypical things. I accept this this for the sake of argument. I accept those things. What is a woman? Because there's this insubstantial quality which nobody seems to be able to tell me what it is. And yet once I've decided that it seems to be the centre of the entire point. Once I've decided that, then all of the other 
um, peripherals, the things we decided weren't important, suddenly get piled onto this new definition. I, I it's surprising in a way because I think in some ways we have great agreement with some of the radical feminists. And when, when I use that word radical, I think we're radical in a different way mm. because we go back to Revelation as a, as a light shone on the way we made. But the feminist women often will say we are radical because we want to go back to the reality of the body. Right. So we share that in, in different ways. Yeah. And and they can see women's bodies being cut up and abused and distorted and yep. and and pornographied and and they agree with us on many many of these points. I was like, listening to one of these radical feminists and they made the point that any philosophy, any idea that makes us have to carve ourselves up in order to be who we think we are has there's got to be something wrong with that. I think I think that's right. And they they are very alert to violence as a sign that something is wrong. Right. Uh, an injustice caused by violence. And they would say things like pornography, um, surrogacy, uh, reproductive technology, uh, and all those, and, and some forms of contraception violate women because they violate women's bodies and women's experience of their bodies. And I think we can agree with them. Or they agree mm. with us. It, it's an interesting... Well, that's another argument that's going on right now, isn't it? Yeah. With the... With the uh, people, people like our friend Melinda Tankard Rice, yeah. uh, who's arguing from a purely secular point of view that pornography is damaging to women, and some of the other people are coming back from the porn industry saying, "No, it's, it's empowering for women to do this." Yeah, let's. In Melinda's answer is usually to list off a whole list of titles of videos that are being pumbled, put through the uh, porn industry, and you go, "Really, really, this is about." Yeah. No. So I think sometimes they are very helpful. To, some of those women have been great pioneers really mm. of identifying problems that sometimes we're caught up in a particular area I, I sometimes think of them as uh, almost like prophetic figures that are out there but actually are doing us a favor right. because they they share some of the concerns that we have about the injustice to women and children yeah so I, I promised at the start of the show that we talk about Dietrich von Hildebrand and his contribution to this now, there's just one little gem that he offered he was talking to men and women and he said if you try to be a man, you end up with a parody of masculinity. If you try to be a female or woman, you just end up with a parody of femininity. He said that God made you male or female. You don't have to make masculinity or femininity. You don't be, suddenly lose your masculinity if you do one thing or another. All you need to do is be virtuous. Live strongly your strengths and live strongly within God's plan and your virtue will then have a masculine hue or a feminine hue it mean it means color so if you and i both work at the same virtue your virtue will come out colored like a like a woman and mine will come out colored like a man not because i had to make it that way but because it just happens because that's something that god created us to do one great thing he said and he, he was very interested in the aesthetics of virtue that virtue right. is beautiful and he said men uh, see, can see things in women that women sometimes can't see in women, and men, women, and vice versa. So he said sometimes men can help women in this life of virtue in a way that other women are not able to because right. they have a perspect that complementary perspective. Yep. And and vice versa. Also, we can hold each other to account. I've noticed that when I was in a lock the change rooms of a football match, the behaviour of men was absolutely abhorrent. And if one woman happened to be in the room when they when, when they were doing this, suddenly their entire behaviour changed yep. um, for the better. That's absolutely right. And that's part of what John Paul II is hinting at in Evangelium Vitae, which mm. is 25 years old this year. Just another shout out to Evangelium <laughs> Vitae. But he, he said, look, the culture of, of life is so dependent on those people who are closest to life in a very intimate way. Mm. And they are women. Right. So it, he follows that sort of von Hildebrandian idea of the virtues, the values of virtue. Mm. Are, are really imp it's it, they're essential to this complementary question and John, von Hildebrand writes beautifully about that excellent if we just made this a new list of what you have to do to be the right kind of person we're in the same boat and sometimes I've seen people put together a, a theology of the body or a genius of women list which looks awfully like all the other so-called traditional lists or the other radical lists and if we're doing that we're actually created a new problem for the next generation. What is it that this particular teaching has as an attractive point, especially for young women, but also for everyone, but 
what is attractive about this about for young women out there and why should they be bothering about this? I think what it really does is it really calls us to become who God made us to be. Sure. And in a specific way that really reflects, I guess, the maternal heart of God. Well, there's something in motherhood that reflects God because he made motherhood and fatherhood together to reflect himself. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's nicely said, Silvana. <laughs> I, um, <Exactly. laughs> I think um, that's very true. There's something um, that is deeper than trying to find roles or descriptions or mm-hmm. lists. I think that's the wrong way to go because mm. I think we, we often just uh, exhibit our own bias or our cultural background when we say that. It's much deeper than that and it takes it's tr- it has a transcendent quality which, as I think Silvana said several times, is calling us to glorify God in who we are. And I, I would say to people who are struggling with you know, gender identity, the very first thing about you is that you're made in the image and likeness of God. God loves you. Yeah. You are a child of God first. That's first. Secondly, that living that out, hopefully you can discover this special way in which God has made you in the body Mm-hmm. And you may have some many challenges. Everyone has challenges because we live in a fallen world where things are broken and we've inherited things and we encounter things and we have terrible sexual experiences and that all feeds into our confusion about it. But if we return to the scriptures, we see how extraordinary Christ is in his relationship with women mm-hmm. and men and he redeems that and we see that in the, the life of the saints. One thing I'd say is, I'm so grateful to be a Catholic woman because the model of women we have is so rich. We've got everyone from Joan of Arc. I mean, imagine living with Joan of Arc. She's wearing armour. (laughs) She's going at the head of an army. She's not the little woman at home. No. She had heard God's voices, which disturbed everybody to the point of her being executed. Mm. She was a puzzling problematic, almost a Flannery O'Connor figure. Right. She, you know, something unusual about everyone from her to women who have lived in the home, women who've lived in convents, women who've been cripples, women who have lived outcast, women who've been queens, women who... And there's so much richness in there. And I often say to women, you'll find a friend, a kind of sister saint, who will help you unpack who God wants you to be as a woman and help you live in a in a... You know that ongoing task of finding our mm. own uh, feminine genius because it is ongoing. We we fall, fail. We and, and the more we go away from God, I think as Silvana suggested, the further we get away from that truth. Mm. And God's well, knitted I, into into by in, knitted into who we are some answers, mm. but obviously we need God to find the path to that. So it's mm. a it's a it's a really it's not a simple thing, and I think. You can't do cookie cutters. Um, I used to say you can't just get a gingerbread man and a gingerbread woman and go, okay, we've got it. We've worked it out. But it is something that John Paul II very wisely said we find in the experience of living Mm. the faith and this experience of living our vocation. So in terms of um, kind of wrapping up at this stage, pretty much if you're made in the image of God, what that says to young women is you're awesome and that your femininity is particularly awesome because that shows who God is to the world. And living that out isn't just one way because otherwise God would have just made not individuals but you know, certain types, type A, type B he would robots. Have used, he would have used banana one and banana two. <laughs> I, I, I used to talk to a friend uh, and we used on. to – we My kids are going to be upset if you're well, going to have B1 We and B2. said the <laughs> weird thing about B1 and B2 is they have no gender. <laughs> Look at them. <laughs> they're both males. Surely. No, no, they're not. They're idiots. They're not. They're just bananas. <laughs> 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 and um, I think <laughs> – you know, I think that, you know, they, they look after teddy bears, don't they? Banana one and banana oh, I two. Remember, I don't sorry. know. But the thing is they are not mother or father and that's been reflected, unfortunately, in our um, birth certificates now where you have parent one and parent two. Well, yes. I think people will go looking for their um, their actual parents in the same way they always have with adoptions. They will They've always done all find that, that sort of stuff. Because we are actually looking for our place in the world and a huge amount of confusion in the masculine end of things comes from um, poor examples of fatherhood, poor examples of masculinity, and poor access to fathers. And like fathers always being away from the home. I'm waiting for the next wave of problems come from not so much women working, but the access, the lack of access people have to their parents Absolutely. in various ways. Yeah. So my advice, um, or perhaps the wrap up from this uh, to young women is, you're awesome. You just have to figure out how you're particularly awesome um, and how that works. And that's unique to you, not to be defined by anybody else. So on that note, it's time 
to end this week's podcast. If today's discussion got you thinking, and very likely, given it's on gender, arguing with your pod- podcast device, let us know. You can subscribe to the podcast at thiscatholiclife.com.au. You can tell us what you like, what you didn't like, or what we should talk about, or what we should have talked about today at info at thiscatholiclife.com.au. Catch up with us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, etc. Um, remember, that this is a uniquely Australian Catholic podcast. We think that's an idea worth getting behind. One last thing before we go, it's time for shout-outs. Silvana. I'm going to give a shout-out to another podcast um, that sheds a light on feminine genius. It's really wonderful and it's awesome. been really big in my um, my faith journey. It's called Abiding Together. Oh, wow. Um, and um, the, co- the hosts for that are Sister Miriam James Heidland, um, Michelle Benzinger and um, Heather Kim. And they're just really wonderful women and they talk about um, – just their journeys in life and what it really means to be a woman and it's yeah i just think if you're going to listen to any podcast other than this catholic life <laughs> listen to inviting together nice. <laughs> that sounds nice. great I know that's one. Anna. shout out um i want to shout out to all the women who are involved in the movement that we we're in called the anima women's network and there's a, a pod there's a website over in perth and shout out to the girls in perth um and there's a group in Melbourne and there's little rumours that there might be something happening in Sydney. So, you might have whispered that to me. Yeah, mm. so stay tuned for that and it will be really exciting. And Silvana will be helping us, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it's um, it's a, a little network um, which is based on the Feminine Genius and on John Paul II's teachings, but obviously brought into the present time and, and addressing things that the other popes have said and, mm. and challenges asking the of question, our time. What does this look like? What yeah. does it look like? And how do yeah. we all work together intergenerationally? How do we work together around the church? And it's something that I've been involved in since 2003 when Pete was working with me. Indeed. So I think um, and I got kicked out. There's a few little. <laughs> <laughs> not, not at that conference. <laughs> not by me. Um, <laughs> but there was. A, a, you look around and you'll see a few little Facebook pages that will direct you direct you to our network. Mm. All right, my shout out has to be given that it's the feminine genius to my lovely genius wife. Um, thank you for being you, and uh, we don't fit the typical models of masculinity and femininity that everyone else seems to think that should happen but it seems to work, and let's keep working at it. That's all for now. Thank you for listening to This Catholic Life.